Hi, this is Amy Proal with the PolyBio podcast, and my guest today is Michael Peluso. Michael is an infectious disease clinical translational physician scientist at University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, and he's involved in both clinical and laboratory research geared at better understanding and treating HIV virus persistence in tissue, sometimes called HIV reservoir. And importantly, Michael also manages the long-term impact of infection with novel coronavirus or LINK study, a large observational study of people who were previously infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus with the goal of understanding the long-term biological consequences of COVID, including long COVID. And LINK opened early in April of 2020, and samples and clinical data are actively being used to evaluate multiple mechanisms of long COVID, for example, SARS-CoV-2 persistence in tissue, altered immune signaling, autoimmunity, microvascular dysfunction, microbial translocation, and other topics that Michael will hopefully talk about today. And with that, Michael, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Cool. So... I mentioned LINK, this long-term infection with novel coronavirus cohort. I hope I'm saying that right. And and that is, as I said, you began in April 2020. And can you explain how this happened? I know that you already had an existing infrastructure to study HIV and you pulled from that to create LINK, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, as you said, I'm an infectious disease clinician and researcher and um, had been working within our existing HIV programs at UCSF um, for a few years at that point. Um, and, you know, we all, at, yeah, at the beginning of 2020, you know, we I remember we had a division meeting um, about this new virus that was emerging and kind of wondering what was going to happen. Um, and, you know, a few weeks went by and there were sporadic cases, typically in people who had traveled or um, you know, had other clear um, sort of like geographic risk factors um, for COVID. Um, but I remember, you know, being in clinic um, in my in my primary care clinic the first week of March of 2020 and getting a notification from the division that um, there was a patient in the emergency room of San Francisco General Hospital um, which is, you know, based in the Mission District in San Francisco, and this patient had not left San Francisco in years, and showed up to the emergency department and tested positive for COVID. And I remember sort of getting that tingling feeling, like, oh no, um, this is happen. This is here. This is happening. Um, and so basically, when you know, when that happened, um, right away, uh, I, I called um, Steve Deeks and Tim Henrich, who were, um, you know, my mentors and colleagues. Um, and we had this kind of emergency meeting to think through, you know, how could we contribute to um, efforts to understand this, this new infection, which was now at our doorstep. Um, and, you know, we knew that we had a very specific skill set. We, you know, we weren't good at helicoptering in to you know, you know, parachuting in in an acute infection and dealing with all of the infection control issues and protective gear and stuff like that. But what we were very good at um, from the HIV world was really intensely assessing and measuring people over the long term um, to sort of understand health over the long term. And at the time in in March of 2020, a hundred percent of the focus was on the short term: who is going to get COVID, who is going to get sick who's going to end up in the ICU, who's going to die. And there was almost no attention on what happened to people after they had COVID, either in the research realm or even in the clinical realm. You know, if somebody got through an acute COVID infection at that time, people were like, great, <laughs> see you when the healthcare system reopens. Um, and so, so anyway, we decided that that was sort of the niche that we could fill. And we were lucky to get early support from NIAID um, via an existing grant that that Tim Henrich had to kind of stand up the infrastructure um, to do this. And so what was really interesting, you know, as an experience was everything was in the process of shutting down, but then simultaneously we were in the process of opening something during that. And, um, and you know, UCSF was super supportive. Um, and we were able to kind of get the protocol through the IRB very quickly. Um, 
and to open our doors, um, you know, basically within a few weeks of of pitching the idea. Um, and so it's, I like thinking back to that time because there was so much uncertainty about what was going on. And, um, you know, our team, you know, spent a lot of long nights on Zoom and, you know, wrote these protocols and tried to figure out how to operationalize this. Um, and it really gave us something to, I think, there was so much anxiety at that time that everybody experienced and it was nice to be able to channel that into developing something rather than just sort of fretting on my couch. Um, uh, and yeah, and then so we, um, you know, obviously long COVID was not um, an entity at that point, but we we figured, you know, what role could we play? We could collect specimens from people after they had COVID to understand post-COVID immunity um, really with a view toward um, informing the development of vaccines. Um, and so a lot of our early specimens were actually um, uh, sent to the National Biodefense Repository, organization like BARDA. Um, and so it was um, great to be able to, you know, provide um, samples that, you know, were eventually useful in kind of solving the vaccine problem. Um, but also we, from the beginning, sort of um, from our experience in other infections, both academic clinical experience and also for many of us personal experience, um, uh, you know, we sort of realized that the likelihood that this was going to be as straightforward as it was initially billed as a two-week infection that then people um, return back to perfect health if they did not die um, was that was way too black and white. And, um, you know, medicine is always more complicated than, than that. And so from the very beginning, we built in clinical assessments to just talk to people about how they were feeling. Um, and within a few weeks of asking people who had had COVID four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks prior, how they were feeling, we learned that a lot of people were not feeling a hundred percent. And, um, and so, we basically became one of the earliest long COVID studies in the world, uh, even though the syndrome had only just started to be um, reported on social media at that time. Yeah. Wow, it's cool. It's actually very cool to think of you guys on these early meetings right when COVID was beginning. And I agree with you. I tried to stay busy at that time too. It was actually I, more comforting in a way to try to do something to see if you can address what's happening. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that one of the strengths is you were able to begin collecting samples on patients so early, right after they got COVID in 2020, but then you kept going with the same patients. I think that's key, right? So you have been able to mostly bring the same people back at different time points at six months and eight months. Is, yeah. that, is that correct? And that way you get this, what we call longitudinal data. So you can actually measure and see how things are changing in these patients over time. And that's, yeah. how did you set yeah. that up where you just, how does that work? You you just yeah. say, hey, will you come back? And most people do, or how does it work? Well, yeah. So, you know, when we designed the study, it's it's so funny to think back to this, right? So the version 1.0 of Link was basically a, a, a four-month study okay. where people would, people who had recently had COVID would come in monthly for four months and answer questionnaires and um, give blood, a lot of blood. Um you know, at that time we were drawing um, about 150 cc's of blood, um, 15 or 16 tubes at each at each visit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people were very motivated because it was an excuse to leave isolation. <laughs> um, uh, and um, and for many of those participants, we were really their first encounter with the healthcare system after they had COVID. Um, which was, you know, I think a really rewarding experience for a lot of our staff at that time um, to feel, you know, we're a research study, but obviously we have relationships with our volunteers. And so to serve in that role, I think was really special and um, a very unique and rewarding experience. Um, but the initial study schedule was, was basically, we'd love for you to come in once a month, about once a month for the next four months. Um, and then we'll kind of see where things go. Because at that time, there was a lot of hope that, you know, by the summer of 2020, it would all be over um, and things would be great. Um, and so we actually, you know, there weren't that many cases. We worked really hard to find people. Um, 
I think it was a good experience for many of our early volunteers and they came back month after month. But then we were like, oh, you know, people are not back to normal. This is still going. Um, and so that summer we, we in real time kind of reconfigured the whole protocol and said, well, actually after those, after that month four visit, we're going to see you every four months going forward for a couple of years. Um, and so we we kind of switched everybody into the new protocol, and you know most people were happy to do that. We actually we we, we were very happy to kind of spread things out because we quickly got very overwhelmed by seeing everybody once a month. Um, uh, but yeah, so we so generally now um, we we see people ab about every three to four months, um, and we're updating our. Um, our protocol now to basically make it indefinite because yeah. you know the pandemic obviously hasn't gone away and long COVID has become a you know a major um, scientific and clinical topic of interest. So I think um, you know so it it's been a really incredible learning experience for me too to kind of figure out how to design and redesign and iterate um, on a, on the study, you know, while it is still going, um, what I always tell people, cause people, you know, you, this is not something that you can look up in a reference book, right? Like this is a disease condition, uh, an infection and a disease condition that was changing week to week. And, um, I think, you know, a lot of people really rose to that. It can be very hard to have a study sort of always evolving. It could be hard for the participants who are used to a routine. It could be hard for the staff who are used to a, uh, assessing people in the same way. But we've tried to remain nimble and kind of, um, you know, change things as we've gone along to make sure that we are positioned to address the questions that are important to um, you know, to people experiencing this condition and to, to the research community. Absolutely. I hope it can go on. And well, look, I hope everyone gets better. Don't get me wrong. I would love if the cohort all came back and said we're recovered, but in knowing that that might not be a possibility, you know, with other, what we call infection associated chronic conditions that I know you're familiar with, like MECFS or even symptoms after Lyme disease, we rarely can ever get patients together at the time when they're infected. And yeah. it's so rare to have the opportunity to have that that the, that data over time. That if you keep going, it only just strengthens how unique the cohort is. Honestly, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really interesting to think back. So, you know, I always people always ask me, you know, well, what's you know what is unique about this situation of long COVID compared to these other post infectious conditions that you mentioned, um, of which there are many. Um, um, uh, and what I always say is that this is the first time in our lifetimes and perhaps ever, um, that literally every single person on the planet is simultaneously at risk for infection with one pathogen that everybody is attuned to, everybody is getting tested for frequently, um, and, and the risk for all of the other things that sort of increase that, that can cause post-infectious conditions like other viruses is low because everybody's at home. <laughs> um, yeah. and so it, it really, my, you know, I think the circumstances of this, the uniqueness of the circumstances really can't be exaggerated. I, I mean, hopefully nothing like this will ever happen again. Um, but uh, my hope is that, um, you know, one of the things that will have come out of this on the back end from, from all of these efforts to understand long COVID as a post-infectious condition is that then we will learn principles that can be applied to other conditions that are thought to be post-infectious conditions that don't have the benefit of everybody knowing what the in incident infection um, was. And so I think that that is an important synergy um, between this effort and efforts to understand other post-infectious conditions. Definitely, I agree. Good, so then you're collecting samples on patients. I know you've blood, PBMCs, 
uh, mostly, I guess, saliva too, sometimes. We did Ish, a lot of saliva. Maybe people, sometimes don't, sometimes. people don't like uh, drooling into a cup, but we uh, we used to do it on everybody all the time. And now yeah. we've, uh, we do it in a more targeted way. That's fair. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we've always, I mean, the core of what we've done is always talking with people about how they feel and trying to systematically record how they feel. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of, it's important to me that laboratory scientists understand just how complicated that is. You know, this is not, you know, in, in April of 2023, this is not a condition where the outcome is you know, something that you can look up in an electronic chart or that you can do a blood test for and say, you know, it's this number. This is really, really nuanced. And, um, you know, the work of the clinical team in, in capturing what the person is experiencing is so important. It's important in multiple ways. Um, the first way in which it's really important is you need to make sure that you're recording things that can actually be attributed to COVID. So, you know, all of us in the course of our lives have all sorts of symptoms. Um, and many of us had chronic symptoms that existed before COVID. And if a study doesn't account for kind of subtracting out what existed before COVID, the outcome's not right. Um, and so that's really important. And that's sort of a complicated thing. Um, and then, you know, the two other things that are important are one is really trying to capture the impact of the symptoms um, uh, because we need to know how, how much people are affected by the symptoms. And that's something that the field has not done a super good job of so far. Although lately there are um, more studies that really look on impact with regard to like return to work and things like that. So that's important. And then the last thing that's really important that I think is so important is you can't just assume that somebody who doesn't, it can't be, it, it can't be um, this assumption that somebody who doesn't bring to you that they have symptoms, a symptom definitely doesn't have a symptom, right? Mm -hmm. So people have different thresholds for mm -hmm. saying I have fatigue or I have headache or whatever, um, that if you don't prompt people, mm -hmm. And we learned this early on, if you don't prompt people, they may not say it. And I think one of the strengths of our efforts from the beginning has been, you know, we don't require people to have long COVID to enroll in the study. Anybody who's had COVID can enroll in the study. And you, you need to be able to compare people with and without long COVID. But we ask people the same questions in the same way, whether or not they think they have long COVID. And what we've learned from doing that is that lots of people who don't, who wouldn't spontaneously say that they have long COVID actually have long COVID symptoms. Mm -hmm. That That is really important um, because you can potentially, you know, misclassify people and miss, you know, different findings that are important for the biology by not measuring people in the same way. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we've been lucky that we've, because our study started before long COVID existed, right. um, we created all of these instruments to to talk to people regardless of whether they have it. Um, and that has been, we really relied on that in, in making comparisons um, to try to understand the biology of long COVID. It's, it makes a huge amount of sense. Yeah, well, that's great. So then, got it. So you have this clinical information on the patient. You have their reported symptoms. I assume you're measuring, obviously, clinical parameters during this visits as well. And then you have their samples. So then I know that you started sharing samples, well, first of all, with other researchers um, at your site, and then even beyond your site to teams at other academic institutions who were doing research on post-COVID consequences, sequelae, or long COVID itself. And how did that start to work? How did you, you had these samples, how did you decide who to send them to or what trends to study or what to focus on? How did you make yeah. those decisions? Yeah, so, you know, um, our... Our MO has always been um, to support kind of the best science that is going on, right? I, I am a clinical scientist. I, am, I work a lot with labs, but I'm not a laboratory scientist. We have great laboratory scientists at UCSF, but not every great laboratory scientist is at UCSF. Mm -hmm. um, and not every great laboratory scientist is in the United States. And so, you know, we in our HIV work, had for decades built up relationships with collaborators 
you know, across the country and around the world. And really at the beginning of this, leverage those collaborations um, to start doing some work um, to, to try to understand the biology of long COVID. I think our role, you know, my role um, has really been in trying to frame the clinical observations and the clinical questions um, and say, you know, it's worth comparing this group of participants to that group of participants. It's worth, um, you know, asking this question or that question. Um, there's a lot, that's really important. Um, uh, and it's as important in, as it, as it is like, you know, running the assay and taking the measurement. And so, um, it's, it's really collaborative. I think our group really thrives on team science and, you know, batting ideas around and, and talking about stuff. And so much of our group's productivity um, in COVID, but also in HIV has been just making unique um, or, you know, clinically important observations that you can only make by sitting in front of somebody and talking with them for an hour. Um, yeah. And so, you know, just like as an example in the HIV world, right, you know, we made these observations, you know, before my time, um, that some people were able to control their HIV without medications and other people, most people, 99% of people, you know, required HIV meds to control their virus. And that, that clinical observation that there were people who got HIV but did not progress to AIDS and were able to have low levels of virus despite not being on treatment became like a, a core tenant of um, the efforts to understand the immune responses to HIV, um, how the reservoir, the HIV reservoir, the virus that persists in a person's body um, after their infection despite treatment um, can be controlled immunologically and was one of the foundations for the whole field of, of that many of us also work on, which is trying to cure HIV. Um, and so that's a clinical observation that was made, right? Um, and so similarly, you know, from the beginning of this, I think all of us who experience long COVID or who know people who experience long COVID or who treat people um, who experience long COVID have said, you know, there are different flavors of long COVID. Not every, it's not, you know, not every long COVID case is the same. Um, and so maybe it is worth studying people who have, you know, this type of symptom or that type of symptom instead of lumping them all together. Um, and I think, you know, now there are formal data-driven efforts to do that, but we've been doing that since the beginning, um, just yeah. based on the sort of big picture gestalt of something. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, I mean, our, we love um, sharing ideas and sharing samples and supporting, you know, good science and, you um, at the beginning, it was trying to convince people that this was an important topic to study. Now, I think everybody is in agreement that this is an important topic to study. Um, uh, and so it's great to see how there's actually a lot more demand now for the samples that we've collected over the years, um, to hopefully get lead to some answers. Definitely. This is interesting, Michael, because I know, you know, I know you somewhat, I know Steven, I know Tim Henrik a bit, who you work with, and I get your role now more when you're describing this as the clinician who is, for example, I think in one or two of your studies, you did patients with, I think you called it neural on COVID, or you were so selecting for the neurological symptoms, or you select for other symptoms, and that's you, in a sense, making these decisions to say, let's take this group of patients, and I've basically come up with because you're yeah. doing this on the fly, because as you say, there really isn't a definition for it. So you're kind of coming yeah. up with it intuitively and yeah. kind of deciding that's really, I guess. Yeah, that. yeah. So that, I mean, yeah. I think that that's, and that's always why I've felt that, you know, there are all sorts of designs for research studies, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, so it's great to have like huge studies that use health record data, but you know, I'm a clinician, I see patients in clinic and document things in medical records. And I can tell you the, the level of resolution that you get from that is totally different than the level of resolution that we get in our research program, where we're spending hours with people and really extensively documenting stuff. Um, and so, you know, what's been really interesting is, you know, it took, it took some time to build up the cohort to a size that we were able to have groups that were large enough within all of the subphenotypes. And, 
when we started doing that, I think we were able to identify a lot more interesting um, observations than we were able to do when we were kind of just saying long COVID, not long COVID, right? So yeah. most of our early papers were long COVID, not long COVID, and a, a few dozen people. And then when we got to a few hundred people, we were able to say long COVID with neurosymptoms, long yes. COVID with cardiac symptoms, long COVID with GI symptoms, long COVID with fatigue, long COVID with more than 10 symptoms, more than five symptoms, just one symptom. Yes. And, you know, we recently published a paper in, in JCI where we relied really heavily um, on that, all those different subdivisions. And we saw that there were some findings that we only were able to identify in the neuro group and not the cardiac group, for example. And so I think that that's where the field is going. Right now, most of that work has been based on sort of my personal feelings about what right. group a person should be in, right? But one of the things that's exciting now that there are so many more people on board and, you know, you know, this collaboration that we're developing with, um, with Richard Sherman, um, like now we can do that in we're, we're building toward doing that in a completely objective data-driven way, which is also going to be really interesting. And we may find things that, you know, we could never find by, by just, um, you know, grouping people clinically. So um, it's very iterative. Um, and I think the, the, the value now that of the, also the value of sharing so widely is that once a measurement is made, the measurement's made and that exists in a database, right? And so even if the definition that we used in 2021 or 2022 was not the best definition, we can still now going forward, recalibrate the definitions and, and look at all of this biomarker data that's been generated by all of our collaborators um, to see whether things shake out differently. Um, yeah. And so I'm really excited to kind of get into that phase of, of this project. It's going to be, I agree. It's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I think forget who said it. I think, you know, computers are only as smart as you program them to be. I mean, there's a point where I'm a little old school when people talk about AI and I'm like, yeah, that's good. I mean, I get AI's use, but I I do think an in-depth clinical visit has a lot of benefit. And I also think I can see why it was pretty important to do with, with long COVID and what you're seeing are these post-COVID patients because you just didn't have any precedent. So what are you supposed to work off of? Like you have to start talking to them to figure it out. And so now when you start to automate that more, you can do it more and you can see how well that goes back and correlates with the way you sort of split them up, you know, from your clinical yeah. visits. And and actually that's gonna be really interesting to see that overlap. Well, yeah. yeah. And then, okay, so you, with your samples and everything from these very well clinically phenotype patients, you have a number of papers out and preprints. So what are some of the top ones that you have? I mean, I could list a few, but what, what are some of the, the work that then ended up being done on this? Yeah. So, you know, most of our initial work was focused on immunology and mm -hmm. um, measurements that were relatively straightforward, like um, antibody levels, antibody dynamics, T cell dynamics, um, uh, things like that. You know, our, our kind of our group's um, background interest has always been in inflammation and understanding inflammation as a driver or byproduct of a, of disease conditions. Um, and so, you know, people who preceded me in our group for HIV did a lot of really important work, um, you know, demonstrating uh, chronic inflammation and HIV infection. And so we we basically began with what we knew, which was applying. Uh, those same sorts of study designs from from um, from that experience to long COVID, and um, you know there was a really interesting study. the The first study of post COVID inflammation that came out, I think, was um, a, actually a blood bank study where they looked at um, people who were donating convalescent plasma a couple of months after they had COVID and compared them to just historical people who donated plasma before the pandemic. And they found that there were higher levels of inflammation among the people who were donating convalescent plasma. And so when I saw that, I thought, oh, wow, that's super interesting. We should look at whether that is driven by long COVID. You know, maybe there are people who have post-COVID symptoms that have more inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was actually the very first um, uh, long COVID paper that we wrote. Um, um, it was published in JID um, a couple of years ago. And we found that there were 
you know, statistically significant subtle differences um, between people who had had COVID four months before and fully recovered and people who had had um, COVID four months before and reported at least one long COVID symptom. And that was sort of the foundational um, paper for our biological work. Um, uh, and then, you know, we built upon that saying, you know, what are the, so does post-COVID inflammation apply in cardiac long COVID? And, you know, the answer is yes. Matt Durstenfeld is a cardiologist in our group, basically honed in on people with cardiopulmonary symptoms. And the strength of that finding was stronger when you looked at cardiopulmonary symptoms. And then we also looked at people with neurological symptoms. And so we worked with neurologists, including Joanna Helmuth at UCSF. And we found that all of these relationships held up and were stronger in people with neurological symptoms. So we sort of applied that to different phenotypes. Um, and then we said, well, what could be the drivers? And so um, you know, we had a paper last year in JCI Insight showing that there's a really strong correlation between um, markers of microbial translocation, so like leaky gut or leaky lung months after people had COVID, direct relationship with the amount of inflammation at that time, really interesting. Um, uh, and then since then, I've looked at other drivers of inflammation, um, including reactivation of, of other latent viruses like the Epstein-Barr virus, which... Um, causes mono and, and showed, you know, which some other groups have reported um, evidence of, of EBV reactivation in people with long COVID, but specifically in people with post-COVID fatigue and post-COVID neurocognitive symptoms, and not necessarily in other groups of long COVID. And so that's sort of what I was getting at before, that the, the, the symptomatic phenotype seems to matter. And then, you know, of course, um, you know, over the last year, one of our major um, focuses has been on whether viral persistence can drive post-COVID inflammation. And that's a, a major effort that we're working on now, um, sort of as part of various collaborative networks to look at viral persistence in a variety of different ways um, in link uh, to see whether this is something that is potentially targetable. Um, yeah. So that I'm, you know, super excited about that work too. Yeah. I'm definitely excited about that work. I, with the viral persistence, I mean, would I assume that your work with HIV helped this topic? So obviously you're studying HIV reservoirs uh, as this is happening. So you had some, I think, foundation for the study of, of potential SARS-CoV-2 reservoir with some of the knowledge I would say, which would be the need to understand what's happening in tissue and not just blood, yeah. trends yeah. like that. What what other, what have you been able to pull from the study of the HIV reservoir into the yeah. potential study of SARS-CoV-2 reservoir? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, uh, in the early days of the pandemic, people would ask me as an HIV doctor, what is the difference between HIV and SARS-CoV-2? And I would say that HIV is a virus that persists and SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that comes and goes. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of like the, the mm -hmm. framework, the textbook answer to that question. But, you know, over the course of the last three years, there's been a, a number of studies that, you know, are increasingly, you know, I would say increasingly hard to ignore that go against that framework. And, you know, when there's one study that goes against the framework, you're like, oh, uh -huh. when there are multiple, then you have to start to revisit the framework. Um, and so, um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, so, you know, there's evidence of uh, long-term persistence of subgenomic RNA and protein uh, in tissue, um, you know, potentially in plasma. Um, and that's very interesting. I think, uh, you know, the H so HIV informed this because we had a lot of infrastructure to study HIV in tissue before COVID, including, right. a you know, a lymph node biopsy program and a gut biopsy program. And so, um, you know, once this became a, a key area of, of interest, we built out those programs to study people who had had COVID instead of people who had had HIV. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we have a, a program, you know, doing gut biopsies in people um, post COVID with and without long COVID um, and doing lymph node biopsies in people post COVID with, with and without long COVID. Um, and so we applied those principles from HIV to COVID, but, but actually the, you know, the virus that I think is an even better um, foundation 
for this is Ebola. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, HIV by its nature is a virus that is known to persist. And mm -hmm. Ebola, you know, when the whole Ebola thing happened 10 years ago, um, uh, you know, Ebola was framed in a similar way, that it was a virus that caused a severe acute infection, and then people survived or died, and that was it. Um, but 10 years of Ebola have shown um, that people who had Ebola, ha lots of people who had Ebola survive and have post-acute sequelae of Ebola um, with a post-acute inflammatory symptom syndrome, unexplained symptoms. And then, you know, it took a few years to get to the point where it became understood that there was actually a Ebola reservoir. Um, and then eventually it became understood that there's a Ebola reservoir that is contagious. Yes. Uh, or that could be contagious, right? And that subsequent outbreaks can happen from that. We are far away from that point with SARS-CoV-2. Right. Um, but I think that that's a really interesting framework because it was an unexpected thing, right? And mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's obviously complicated and nobody is saying that there is active replicating SARS-CoV-2 that has been found and can infect another person. But the reason that I think this is so important um, and, you know, virologists feel that that is very important, that you have to identify active replicating virus. But your immune yeah. system can respond to um, to pieces of virus, yeah. um, to viral proteins and to viral RNA and other viral antigens, and that can affect how people feel. So I think both are important. Um, uh, and I, I hope that this huge concerted effort now um, we'll get some answers over the next couple of years um, as to exactly what's going on, because um, that also has treatment implications. Definitely. Yeah, the post Ebola syndrome or post Ebola sequelae was definitely key to my own thinking, too, because you'd seen that it's a single stranded RNA virus, just like SARS CoV 2. And I agree with you, HIV, you have the, you know, it's a retrovirus, there's differences there, but with the single stranded RNA virus and this capability with the anatomical sanctuaries that's what it's kind of the equivalent in the Ebola world where it was you know eye tissue semen it was the sampling of again going beyond just blood that was fine you know where you had to look to find either it's just genetic material or you know product from yeah. the pathogen and I think that that's pretty now getting iterated into this as like a at least important topic to study a lot just yeah. to, to, to go there yeah I think then I know your site then then is now beginning clinical trials or trying to um, trying to <laughs> trying to with the goal and i i know steve deeks who you work with would say this not even just to you know trial the drug but actually because the trial itself can actually be used to inform pathogenesis in other words if you run an antiviral clinical trial and a yeah. lot of people feel better there is some likelihood that that's probably targeting for example pers yeah. persistent virus so yeah. there's is that what you're trying yeah, to Yeah. So, you know, when people think about clinical trials, what most people are thinking about are, you know, randomized control trials of hundreds or thousands of people taking a pill or a placebo, like a intervention pill or placebo. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, many clinical trials are like that. And that's how drugs get brought to market. And um, those types of studies are important. But um, I think, you know, the other thing from our work in HIV that has really informed this is that we are very used to um, these more experimental medicine type clinical trials where there is a problem that seems unsolvable, curing HIV, curing long COVID. And before you rush to a clinical trial um, that, you know, test something that's easily, you know, it, we need clinical trials that test treatments that are already on the market, that are easily available, that have good side effect profiles that are safe to see if we can get people feeling better. That's very important, but that doesn't necessarily address like what is the biological driver of long COVID. And, um, I think our experience in HIV really informs that because it, it is a problem that seems nearly impossible to solve, right? Eliminating the HIV reservoir yeah. um, or, or controlling the HIV reservoir. And what we have experience in is doing these small, intense proof of concept studies that could not be implemented at scale easily, mm -hmm. um, but are rationally designed 
have a biological hypothesis and regardless of whether the intervention actually works at the ultimate goal, which is curing someone of their symptoms, you learn something about the biology from having done the study. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we love doing. That's what I came here to do and I love doing. Um, those are studies of, you know, not hundreds of people, but, you know, dozens of people or a couple of dozen people. Um, and I think that um, that those studies need to get more prioritization and support alongside the larger studies. Um, because unless you're able to guess something that's going to work at scale, um, we, we really need to be investing in understanding the biology. Um, and, and so, you know, we are in the process now, like, obviously I can't speak to all the details, but of trying to design and, and launch, um, a number of studies that are, you know, 20 to 30 people, very intense, um, of different sort of immune system therapies or like more complicated therapies that would affect the virus um, to, you know, of course we will assess whether people feel better, but the primary outcome of the study is really, you know, how does the biology change? Are we able to detect virus beforehand or not? Do people have higher levels of inflammation beforehand or not? And then is there some sort of indication that there is a signal um, with the symptoms that people are experiencing. And so there has not been a lot of investment or support for those types of studies so far. And I'm hoping we'll see more of that. Yeah, so I, I get it then. So what you're doing is you're doing a smaller number of patients, but you're measuring, you're taking advantage, for example, I know you could measure spike protein, for example, has been being measured in blood via either the Samoa technology that David Walt has or other teams that are using some, so you could measure, and obviously spike proteins there suggest that someone might still have the SARS-CoV-2 virus if they, a long COVID patient has that in their blood. So you would measure these, uh, these actually use some of these metrics on these patients. Would you do even imaging or what other stuff would you, are you doing around the intervention to get this deeper understanding of biology? Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, we're basically, our goal is to leverage everything that has been built exactly. um, over the last few years. Um, you know, we're very mindful of, there's a balance, right? So it's, we think it's very important to like do solid measurements before an intervention, solid measurements after an intervention and have a, have a placebo group. Like those yeah. three things are really critical. Um, you know, there's we have the infrastructure and we can leverage all of these collaborations that we've built to then say you know we've done a clinical trial of therapy x and we have highly characterized samples in people before they got the intervention or placebo and we have highly characterized samples after they got the intervention or placebo and now let's figure out what changed yeah. um so that might be using existing technology, um, you know, like looking at plasma antigen levels in people who are willing to do more intense stuff like gut biopsies, it might be doing a gut biopsy before and after mm -hmm. and seeing how things change. Um, you know, wouldn't probably require that of someone, but somebody who's interested and, and willing and able and willing um, could do that. Um, uh, and so, you know, these are designed to basically use a similar set of core clinical measurements. So, in, you know, standard instruments, promise scores, you know, compass for dysautonomia, NIH toolbox, things like that. Um, standard clinical instruments, uh, you know, a, a basic suite of laboratory measurements that can be done in real time. But the real value of all of this is what we collect and store yeah. um, and can figure it out afterwards. Cool. Um, and and so, um, yeah, so we're on the cusp of hopefully launching some of these uh, over the next few months. Um, and, you know, I'm hopeful that um, at least some of them will launch and we'll, we'll learn something. Definitely. That makes sense. So in other words, someone's already in your link study. I mm -hmm. guess I understand. So you have these measurements because you're increasingly sending their samples out to teams doing a lot of different forms of analysis, or you can because you have a lot yeah. of bank sample. 
Yeah, then but... some people go through the intervention, a, a particular, yeah. you know, in this form of clinical trial. And then because yeah. they're part of the study, they're going to come back in later. And so you're going to get those samples later and you have the capacity to then measure more things. So you now know that you can go pretty in depth on what happened before and after those people had the intervention. I assume yeah. then that that's also good for getting companies and pharma and, and really interested in this space, because if you can show in a smaller group of patients and you can actually show them some really measurable, meaningful changes, that might be what it takes to, in a sense, convince them that a larger clinical trial is worth it, that they hopefully yeah. support. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, it's, it, there's definitely been, I've been really pleased to see like a, a strong interest from the various stakeholders. I think, um, you know, operationally, like a lot of scientific collaborators, you're ready to go. Um, a lot of companies are potentially willing to provide, you know, a, a study drug or, um, you know, matching placebo. Um, and the, the, the key thing is, you know, finding money to actually fund the 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 nuts and bolts of the clinical trial itself um and so that so there are all different pieces that kind of have to fall into place uh but it's there's definitely been um a huge shift in a good way in interest um among all of the different stakeholders uh over the last couple of years you know when when we started pitching these ideas in like November 2020 we were met with a lot of skepticism, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of skepticism. And um, most of that has gone away now. Um, and I think everybody recognizes that this is a problem that really needs to be solved. And it's um, just a matter of, um, you know, developing and implementing the infrastructure to kind of come at it from all angles. Um, and so, you know, there, there are going to be big national programs like Recover um, that are going to be doing clinical trials and will contribute to this. And then there are going to be, you know, pure like pharmaceutical company studies, I'm sure, that are going to try to tackle this. And then um, there are going to be, you know, academic collaborations um, um, or foundations that try to tackle this. So mm -hmm. I, my hope is that everybody will be kind of like focused in the same direction. Um, and everything will end up being really complimentary um, and we'll get answers that people really need. Definitely. Okay, well, yes. I mean, sounds good, Michael. I think, you know, thanks for walking me through all of this. You've obviously been really busy over the past years um, and I don't really see it slowing down, but that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm also optimistic that it's great to know, obviously that, you know, the skepticism that's, is now dropped away and you're really, at least for the most part, and you're really kind of moving full speed ahead and have this incredibly unique cohort of study and patients and a, a lot of opportunity. So I look forward to checking in down the line to see where you're at. Yeah. Hopefully a year from now, I'll have preliminary data from the clinical trial. We'll see. I hope so. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Cool. Thanks a lot.